Today's guest is Dr. Jeffrey J. Kripal, religious scholar. He helps direct the Center for Theory and Research at the Esalen Institute. This guy's got some stories. People are getting hit by lightning, dying, and coming back with superpowers. What's going on? We discuss virtually every badass from history that's claimed to have some superpowers. Padre Pio, Madame Blavatsky, Emmanuel Swedenborg, Teresa of Avila. This shit is wild, my friends. You're not going to want to miss it. We also discuss the fact that social media, computers, what is that doing to your spirituality? Gnosticism, where that comes from, what the word heresy truly means. So I wrote this book in 2010 called Authors of the Impossible. And one of the things I took away from that project was all of these words we have today, like paranormal or psychical or supernormal, they're all invented by intellectuals and scientists at the end of the 19th century. And then what happens in the 20th century is, is computers. <laughs> You know, a kind of understanding of the mind is just a function of the brain, and the brain just is a wet computer. And that's so recent. It just, it devastated this earlier kind of openness to this among intellectuals. Of course, as always, we package all of this into a nice bite size for you to understand how you can apply all of these teachings in your life. Leave us a review. Leave us a like. Go check us out on Rumble. Subscribe, and we will see you guys. Okay, Jeff, welcome. How's it going? Thanks. Thanks for having me, Will. It's it's early in the morning here, so if I, I sound a little weird, that's why. <laughs> no worries. Uh, I just thought, yeah, I appreciate you being here. And like I said before we got going, there's so many places we are about to go on this, this little journey here. But um, could you give us a, a good understanding of who you are and, and your, your research and... <laughs> Uh, you know, for everything we're getting ready to get into, it'd be nice to know what you've done. I, I wish I knew who I was. <laughs> that's that's the deep. That's the deeper question. Um, certainly, as a social ego, my name is Jeff Kripal. Uh, I'm 61 years old. I grew up in the American Midwest. I grew up in a hardware store. Um, I wanted to be a monk. Um, that didn't work out for a variety of reasons. I became a scholar of comparative religion. I sort of backed into the academy, Will. I, people ask me about the academy all the time. And I said, well, you know, it's it's just where people go, don't belong anywhere else. They, they, the uh, university was the only place that would have me. Um, so that's where I have asked my questions about religion as a, as a whole now, um, really a, around the globe, not just locally. And I got into, I think, what most people would think of with the paranormal a few years ago when I was studying the American counterculture and talking to a lot of people who had had these sorts of experiences and um, just realized we didn't really have any way of understanding them. We had a way of describing them, but we didn't have a way of understanding them. And I, so that's, that's what I do now is I try to um, make some meaning out of, out of people's very bizarre experiences. Okay, so let's dive deeper into some of these bizarre experiences. So in doing, obviously, some research, and I've, I've been listening to you uh, for, for some time, like I said, some of these mysteries are otherworldly, uh, to put it lightly. Uh, uh, can we start with something that I don't think I, I've heard you talk? What specifically on some of these, from levitation to remote viewing to uh, demonic possession, near-death experiences... Which one do you find the most fascinating and why? I find the precognitive uh, dreams and the precognitions the most convincing. They're, they're often overwhelming and they often go into great detail about future events that play out in, in precise detail. Um, so it's really precognition I always point to is, is really some of the most provocative philosophically or intellectually. But I'm also really interested in the really strange and, and bizarre aspects of, say, UFO encounters or entity encounters and why we want to take off the table all the, all the stuff we don't understand. I think that's a mistake. Um, I think it's, it's, it doesn't make sense to us for a good reason, and that's sort of what it's trying to tell us. Uh, and we need to sit with that and accept that and not just deny that with easy words like like. Um, anecdote and coincidence and other other kind of cop-outs then okay so precognition maybe you should explain also what it is for anybody who who doesn't know and uh have you had any precognitive experiences 
I did. I had one really life-changing precognitive dream oh decades ago now. I I don't speak about it because it involved it involves some colleagues and some very uh, very legal and very dangerous, socially dangerous situations. But I think the the precognition, um, I didn't recognize it at the time as a precognitive dream, by the way, but I recognized it within 24 hours as about that day that had played out in, in very dramatic terms. And it helped me respond to the situation. And I think a very healthy, very careful way. I, I don't think I'd be sitting here if it weren't for that precognitive wow. Okay. And that's one of the crazy things about all precognitive experiences. And so for, I mean, we didn't define it necessarily, but correct me if I'm wrong and to say that precogn precognition just allows you to deem or gain information on something uh, outside of your normal senses that would predict the future potentially. Yeah. It's, um, precognition is interesting. It's also tied to literary creativity in a really interesting way. Uh, I think yeah. super, people who are super creative are precognitive, but what's What's really unique about precognition is you often don't know it's precognitive at the time. You, you you mistake it for something else. So there's something about, it's not so much predicting the future. It The way that people describe it is they're actually describing something that has already happened. So it's ve it looks very much like the future has already happened. And that what a precognition is, is, is some kind of cognition. It's some kind of knowing of a future state that already has happened. And so it, it leads into this whole, what the heck is time and why are we caught in this linear arrow? And uh, I, you know, my, my personal conviction, Will, is that human beings are um, remarkable um, sort of quantum sensors, to use a popular word, and that we sort of pick up things in the physical environment that we, we don't recognize and that we translate those in a very quick and largely unconscious way into dream, into vision, into intuition, into a gut feeling. And we translate them in all sorts of ways, but um, it's important that we don't recognize them. I think that that trick, tricky part of it is part of the process. I'll, I'll share with you one. I have plenty of precognition, precognitive dreams of which I, I won't share too, but uh, here's one that was just uh, strange for me that just kind of highlighted the, the absurdity of you know being human. I'm a, I'm from Kansas City. I know you're from the Midwest. I don't know where you're from. Yeah, no, I, I know Kansas City well. I, I actually went to school just south of there in a, a okay. little seminary, Catholic seminary. So I didn't know you were from Kansas City. That's, yeah. That's the KC, the KC uh, baseball. KC, yeah. uh, there you uh, go. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm from there. The Chiefs fan, of, of course. Uh, that's the football team for, for those of you who are from outside of the U.S. Uh, and a few years ago, we were in a Super Bowl uh, final. I guess match game. I don't know what it's called now. I can't can't think. But uh, uh, against... it's not called a match game. Will. Yeah, I can't. It, you know, it's my sport is is soccer. Yeah. So, but yeah. It, it, in any case, we were playing against Tom Brady. Tom Brady was still playing at that time. Uh, it was this big showdown between Patrick Mahomes, and Tom Brady, uh, and I was not in the country. I think this was during COVID time. It might have been twenty 2020 twenty or twenty twenty one. And uh, I woke up. Maybe this is a couple weeks before, or maybe a week before the game. I woke up with a dream, vivid as all. And if you're an American, you know what the ESPN Sports Center score result looks like. I had that blazoned on my screen of space mind with the score uh, of the game there. However, Tom Brady was holding up his hands and a helmet. So this is a big problem for me being a, a Chiefs fan. That's not my team. I don't like this, but I could tell by the emotions that I had and obviously from having precognitive dreams that what I had just dreamt was going to happen and without a doubt. And because I was so sure of it, I wanted to document it. So I went on one of our obscure Instagram pages and just typed in the score uh, so that I could have proof that I knew. Uh, the score ended up being, I, I, it was a very strange game. And so uh, it ended up, I ended up missing this score just by about four points. Like it was a small just a small difference. But uh, then when I told my friends and people, they were just, you know, do you know how much money you could have made if you, had just, <laughs> if you had just bet on it? And I'm like, I'm not betting against my team, first off. But in any case, I, I draw that crazy uh, anecdote out there because this stuff, what you're studying, what you're interested in, can be very mundane and it can be very life-changing. And 
we've had people on who have had near death experiences um, and people who study near death experiences. And so I'm curious for you, why do we live in, and let me pull your exact, your, your quote. I think you had said something along the lines of that. The reigning model of neuroscience is the production model, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, essentially this materialistic sense of the world. Why do we live with this being the status quo if clearly something else is going on? Well, we don't talk about it enough is, is a short answer. Um, so first of all, let me back up into your your Super Bowl precognition. First of all, I'm from um, the southeast of Nebraska, and Kansas City is is our team as well, by the okay. way. There are no professional teams in Nebraska, none, none. Yeah. So people either go to Denver, they go to Chicago, <laughs> they go to Kansas City, and, and most of them end up going to Kansas City. So, okay. So I, I, mm -hmm. I'm aligned with you, Will, nice. um, <laughs> in terms of American football. Okay. Um, I think it's also significant, you know, where I really, really got – keyed on to precognition was working with a near-death experiencer named Elizabeth Crone, who was struck by lightning. And she had all of these precognitions, mostly of plane crashes and tsunamis and earthquakes and stuff. But what struck me about them and what struck me about your story was that her precognition was actually at the exact angle and perspective of the photograph that would appear in the newspaper or the television the next day. And I, I began to suspect that Elizabeth was precognizing her own perception on the internet or the television or the newspaper of the event, and that that was then retro -causal causing this dream, which then presented this whole narrative and this whole vision. Um, so it it certainly doesn't deny precognition; it just changes what it is and. I think it's very significant that you saw an ESPN screen, which is probably what you saw. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, wow, that changes things. That really changes things, you know, in a really, because when in my youth, when I was a young man, like you probably, um, I, I had this sort of, I, I want to call it this naive view that the soul somehow le leaves and and it's not in space time, and it somehow perceives this event that's in the future, and then it somehow returns to the body. And I don't think that anymore. And, and in fact, what Elizabeth's precognitions taught me was that I think her brain is communicating with her brain, you know, and it's doing this in a retro causally or, or, or fashion that confuses us, but it really is. Okay, so that's that's the theory. Now, the answer to your question is why to me, um, that's a big question. Why are we essentially caught in a worldview that is inadequate? And I think I think there are a couple reasons. One is is that's very efficient and pragmatic. Uh, it allows us to do things like make refrigerators and get, make computer screens and and drive down the road and go to work because we imagine that we're different. We're 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 not the same. People were not were not our cars or our refrigerators, but I also think, and this is the deeper question. Well, there's three there's three answers. The other answer is I think we just suppress these stories. I think if you my experience lecturing in both Europe and the U.S. is that these stories are actually really common. Um, if I talk to a room with 200 people in it, 180 of them are going to have these stories that they're willing to tell. And I think the other 20 are just not willing to tell their story. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think we present the illusion. I think our societies present the illusion that these are rare when, in fact, they're not rare at all. <laughs> and I think that's very significant because I think it's very important that we're super connected. Um, and I think we need to know that. Now, here's the deeper answer to your question, though. There's something about consciousness or let's let's call it the phenomenon that appears that is deceptive and so i don't think like like take the ufo event or the encounter event people will often talk about deception as if it's just this you know it's just the cia or the the military or the or the the, the hoaxer i'm like actually that's not true the the phenomena itself is presenting itself in a way that is deceptive it's camouflaging itself. This is what life forms do, by the way. 
this is a mark of intelligence, is camouflage or deception. And so I think whatever we are deep down, whatever the, the life force is deep down, is somehow deceiving itself for, for a good reason. And I don't know what that is because I'm one of the deceived, Will. I, I'm, yeah. I, I, I don't claim this. But I know from talking to experiencers that what appears ain't what's there. That's it. That's it. I know that. So I think there's all kinds of levels to your question. And I think it just depends on how deep you want to go. And um Yeah, I I don't know, right? Uh, you know, there is a a large camp of people who will feel that uh and we can get into this uh more, obviously, that anything that is now considered a cult uh or out there where a lot of these things do from teachings to all this stuff, um, that that was done on purpose by whether it's the CIA for one, the church for another, uh, the elite. I don't know. How do you, how do you feel about that belief that? Yeah, I'm not a conspiracy thinker. I, I, uh, first of all, I've been involved. I've been inside big institutions. So I, I was in the church by the way, the Catholic church. Um, and now I'm part of a university. I, I've never been part of the government or the military, but I just don't think people are capable of that. Um, I don't think there are committees somewhere controlling these things. I, I don't. I just don't believe these conspiracy theories. I think the phenomenon itself is deceiving us, and so I think people attribute that deception to other human beings because it makes them. You know, the, here's the beauty of conspiracy thinking: it makes you feel special because now you have the secret, and. <laughs> No one else does, you yeah. know, screw them. They're, they're yeah. a bunch of idiots. I have the secret, you know? Well, you don't, okay? And so that's a tougher, you know, that's a tougher position to take. And so my my barometer in my head when I talk to people, by the way, you passed, Will, you passed it, <laughs> um, is if this person is certain and claims to know something, I don't really want to talk to them. But if this person says, I don't know, or I'm open, um, chances are they're, they're closer to, to the truth of things. And I, I don't have the truth either, Will, but I know that if you know, you don't know. I know, <laughs> you know, to be, yeah. to, be, to be clever about it. Um, and what I mean by that is, I don't think, well, consciousness is what, is what I'm really talking about. I don't think it's cognitive. I don't think it's an idea in our head. I don't think it's a function of a computer we call the brain. I don't even think it's physical. And so that, you know, that puts me at odds with the, the, anyone who's proposing the production thesis because that's just physicalism. You know, that's just, oh, it's just physics. It's just neurons firing in the brain that's producing the illusion of awareness. I'm like, no, nah, that's not, that's not. Yeah, it does seem in, in, inadequate. It obviously explains many things. It's very useful uh, in in uh, not necessarily not even science. I mean, I guess there has to be a delineation between the scientific method and what is science and science in modern day and the influence of corruption and the influence of bias and a lot of different things can can go on. Uh, but I actually wanted to because you mentioned Elizabeth Crone and I was hoping you might mention that because that is a very fascinating story. Could you? Maybe explain what happened there. Yeah, no, I can I can talk about Elizabeth. Please, <laughs> she was she wouldn't mind either. Um, Elizabeth went to law school. She didn't finish law school. She was a a Houston mother of two small boys in 1988. It was I think it was no, September of 1988, and she was going to the yard site or the the first anniversary of her grandfather's death at her local synagogue which, by the way, is right across the street from where I work. Um, and she got out of the car, and she had an umbrella. It was raining. It just started to rain out of nowhere, and she was struck by lightning. Uh, and she kept walking into the synagogue, and she couldn't figure out why no one was paying her any attention until she looked out the door and saw her own body crumbled up, you know, essentially smoking in the rain. And so she then had this very elaborate near-death experience that went on in her experience for two weeks. It was actually only two minutes here in this 
this place and time, but it was two weeks in this other world. And she describes it in great detail in this book we wrote together. Um, and then she comes back, you know, and she's, of course, in a lot of pain. She's just been struck by God only knows how much electricity. And But like most lightning strike victims, by the way, she survives. Most lightning strike victims do survive. Um, and then she starts to develop all these paranormal abilities, uh, including precognition, dreaming. She gets a phone call from her dead grandfather. I mean, phone calls from the dead are, believe, yeah. believe it or not, not that uncommon. And um, it just goes on and on and on like that, you know, for years. Sure. And I started to, I knew, I met Elizabeth, it was probably 2014, 2015. One of my students or one of my former students asked me to come over to the medical center and talk at this event on near-death experiences in the modern hospital. And so I went over and did that, and I met Elizabeth there, and I heard her story, and I was just like, oh, my God, Elizabeth, that that is the greatest story. And she's like, yeah, I know. I, she, I said, you should write a book. And, and she says, well, I don't know how to write books. I said, well, I know how to write books. But I don't have a great story. So we we wrote this book together called Change the Flash, and it plays out this, this near-death experience. And part of my argument of the book is, look, this is important. This this story wants to be told. Uh, it wants to be um, a book in this case, but it means something. It means that we have these abilities that we're not we're not admitting, and 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 one of them is precognition. But there are other there are other abilities, by the way. She, by the way, had a precognition of a Super Bowl too, and and got and got it right. By the way, oh no way! I've never been yeah. struck by lightning. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no, you don't want to be struck by lightning. That's the thing. You don't want to be struck by lightning, but. But, it's, but she did have a Super Bowl precognition as well. Trauma is one way in which these powers can uh, can appear. Are there others? Yeah. I mean, Will, look, I I grew up in southeastern Nebraska, and my dream was to be an NFL quarterback. Right. That was that was what I wanted to do. Guess what? Yeah. That didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> right? Be, okay. Because I, I didn't have the genetic skill set to do that, okay? So I, th I think these... Abilities are skills. Mm -hmm. I think we evolved with them, or they evolved as us uh, over over many, many hundreds of thousands of years. And I don't think they're evenly distributed, um, like any other skill set. It's just not. It's just not evenly distributed. Um, and I know this from studying religion too. You know, religious prodigies are not like us. The there are people. Who are shamans in indigenous cultures? They are not like the other people. <laughs> Trust me, they're not. And uh, I've worked with experiencers and in this culture, and they are different. They are just different, and they have abilities that I think maybe lie in us as well. But but you and I haven't. I mean, I can't speak for you, but I haven't been struck by lightning. I haven't. Near, I guess I have nearly died once, but I. No, I don't have Elizabeth's abilities, and um, and I think that's okay, too. There's a reason for that. The Way of Will John Espanol is here. All of our podcasts are now published in Spanish right here on YouTube, so make sure to go check that out. Also, wayofwilljohn.com, everything you could want to know about spirituality, wealth creation, health, navigating politics, you can all find right there, including our Manifestation Masterclass Everything is completely free. Go to the website, put your email in, and start to change your life, my friends. I always find it fascinating, and we uh, we just had David Morehouse on. I've had Tom Campbell on. I've had Dean Radin on. Uh, we just had we had a guy named Grandmaster Wolf on, and these are all people who have delved into the training aspect of it, which is fascinating to me, just as a professional athlete, into knowing what could be done. And as a matter of fact, our very first podcast. I'm going to forget the name of the book. I think it may, it may be called Mind Over Matter, but it was a guy who decided he had been, he's a journalist and he had spent most of his time studying betting, uh, you know, betting in sports and, and things like this until he shifted. And he found that mm, the U.S. government or arms of it were using, once again, actually the NFL uh, to study certain phenomenon and what would happen, uh, whether it was extrasensory perception, uh, things happen to athletes, let's just say, when they get into this zone and flow. And they were studying this for its applications within the military uh, world. 
I would love to know if there is, or if you've run across this, let's say within the religious text, do you have a center within your religious uh, studies? Like, is there a, I is there a focus? I'm in a department of religion at a, at a university, a secular university, by the way. But no, I, I, I meant uh, within your field of study. Do you Did you focus on one specific area? No, so it's general. Oh, yeah, it's everything. I'm, I'm an intellectual omnivore. I, 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 okay. I look at anything and every, anything that fits or anything I find interesting. All right. Well, does the West and uh, you'll see where I'm going because uh, I've also I'm also fascinated by Rudolf Steiner uh, and Rosicrucianism. I don't know very much. So when I say I'm fascinated, it's something that I would love to know more about. And I know you do know. And I know that that field in the West is some form of also delving into these these subjects. Uh, could you explain what that is? And also, you know, this West, we don't have a tradition for this. Why don't we have any tradition in the West that pushes for it? Well, so first of all, Rosicrucianism is, is that what you want me to talk about? Rosic sure. Let's talk about it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a European, it means the Rosy Cross, the tradition of the Rosy Cross. And it was probably invented, by the way, it was probably made up by a, um, a German uh, author in the early 1600s or mid 1600s. And a lot of European intellectuals and philosophers whom we would now call scientists wanted to be a part of this tradition because essentially what Rosicrucianism argued was that there were these <laughs> there, there were these very special secret individuals who guided society through their research and their writing. And you know, the early, the early, uh, particularly the early English scientists, they all knew that what they were saying, what they were thinking was deeply heretical to to the church, and so they formed something called the Invisible College, which which um, was related. It's not the same thing as Rosicrucianism, but that sort of sense of secrecy uh, and living in a society and asking questions that shouldn't be asked is is very much a part of both of these traditions. What you might not know, Will, is actually Rosicrucianism is very important to the UFO. Um, okay. Both J. Allen Hynek and Jacques Vallée um, were very attracted to Rosicrucianism. They weren't official Rosicrucianists. I mean, well, I don't even know what that means anymore. Um, but they were attracted to the idea that there were this sort of secret group of intellectuals who who could ask questions that, that other people weren't willing to ask in public. And the UFO in particular, I mean, it's just a, it's a cipher. It's not, I'm not saying UFO is machine in the sky. I'm saying it's this whole panoply of excuse me, of phenomena that they kick in and it gets framed in a science fiction way today, but it actually is is very recognizable to, to these earlier traditions. Yeah, I and could you maybe touch more on what is going on, let's say, with this UFO uh, field of... It's well, very. Did we, it's, did we did we answer your question on the? I mean, what were, what was what were you interested in with Rosicrucianism? This sort of notion of um, as I understand Rosicrucianism, as like you said, it's hard to define where and what it what it stands for now. Uh, I, I think you there said is you were also interested in Rudolf Steiner. I mean, that's again a classic kind of es, what we call an esoteric writer and thinker. And by esotericism, I I mean secrecy. There's a kind of secret knowledge there but it's not it's not some piece of data that i can share with you and then you have it it's like no it's for it's, it's a state of mind or a state of consciousness that you either have or you don't and and you know it by being it and the thing about steiner i don't you know i don't know a lot about rudolf steiner but i know a lot of the things he knew came to him in visions and in in very kind of science uh, science fiction displays and, and visionary forms and this is the thing about religion that I find so fascinating is what what we call revelation. It's given. the The person's not making shit up. Uh -huh. the 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 per, The vision or the display is is just presented to the person, and somebody like Steiner then is going to report that that vision in fairly accurate, fairly how it happened. But that doesn't mean. And this is where Jeff comes in. That doesn't mean we have to sign our names to every vision that some human <laughs> being sees. Uh -huh. um, because as you've probably heard me say on other podcasts, I, I talk to hundreds of experiencers. And guess what? They all have a different experience. So I can't sign my name to what Elizabeth saw in the afterlife because then I can't talk to this near-death experiencer over here or this one over here. I, 
they exclude one another if you interpret them literally. If you back up and say, oh, th this is what's displaying itself in these individuals, then suddenly you have a model where you can s start to understand all these people and and make some really interesting moves. And and so that's what I try to do. Will. I, I, I try to step back. Yeah, I mean, that uh, it's also important to always know every experience that we go through is filtered through our our perception our you know we're, we're, we're this west centric uh thought we're we're products of this if we had thought in the, by the way elizabeth right she saw things in her experience that were very much aligned with how she had grown up yeah very jewish she's very jewish she's she grew up in a um a liberal uh, synagogue and you know, she talks a lot about the garden and God as a male. And I mean, the reincarnation ha is in her story, I mean, which is very much a part of the Kabbalistic tradition. And so there are lots of things about her story that, that certainly fit her Jewish tradition, but there are other things that don't fit well. And yeah. what were those? Well, so when she came out, when she when she had her near death experience, she she used very modern language, and she's described herself as much more spiritual, but much less religious. And what she meant means by that is, she doesn't feel as aligned with her institutional tradition, although she's still part of it. She feels much more aligned with this unconditional love that she she knew directly in in, in the other world. So. And to me, as a as a historian, as a scholar, I'm much more interested in spontaneous experiences that don't fit in, yeah. because what people like me will always say is, "Oh, it's the context that just created the experience." So I'm interested in these ex these experiences that clearly were not created by their context, um, or or if they were in a very complicated ways. I'm interested in these spontaneous cases. You can't you can't practice getting hit by lightning. <laughs> but you yeah, can get yeah. hit by lightning. And if you practice something, and I do think these skills can be practiced, but take David Morehouse, for example. I mean, I don't know David, but the guy was shot in the head, Will. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, come on. Talk about <laughs> talk about trauma. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I've read other experiencers, they do things like they jump in swimming pools at the wrong end and they they almost break their neck and then suddenly they become a mathematical genius. I'm like, well, there you go. You know, there you go. Um, so that's why I'm not interested. It's not that I don't think practice works. Of course it works. Sure. But it only works sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah. If it, if it did work all the time and we'd had, we would we probably wouldn't have so many different mystical traditions and we would have a nice, simple, <laughs> do this, do this, do this, do this. You're a superhero. Uh, are you familiar with Emanuel Swedenborg at all? Yeah, yeah, I am actually. Very, uh, very much so. Okay, because I have a book on him. I mean, I know he's written, uh, or he, he wrote a lot, actually. Could you explain his case? Because I feel like he's one of these characters that maybe potentially as the as this movement of expansion and expanding consciousness goes on, he might get some love. One of my jokes about Emanuel Swedenborg is that every damn alley you go down at the end of it's Emanuel Swedenborg. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, you know, so he was um he was a Swedish scientist. He uh, if I if my memory's right, he was basically head of the Swedish government that 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 oversaw um in engineering and, and mining and things like that. And pretty late in life, he suddenly began to have visions. Um, he probably had some kind of stroke or something. We don't really know. But he just, he like overnight became this savant, this sort of spiritual savant. And he wrote many, many books um, on the afterlife and on these abilities. And he was also, by the way, a spy. Uh, what? Yeah. For? For Sweden. You got, okay. Yeah. I mean, this this is another, um, this is really interesting. He was also, the other thing about Swedenborg that was so fascinating, you know, he was also very significant to a man named Immanuel Kant, who wrote a book uh, early on in his career. He wrote it anonymously. He basically made fun of Swedenborg. But it's clear to Kant that he actually believed that Swedenborg was the real deal and that he had these sort of clairvoyant or telepathic experiences. 
And nobody could explain them, of course, at the time, but people recognized that this this was the real deal. And then Swedenborg then becomes really important to American religious history, particularly in the 19th century with the rise of spirit, spiritualism, which was essentially contacting the dead. Uh, and so all of these, mostly women, who in the middle of the century become mediums are really harking back to Swedenborg, by the way, um, although not always consciously. What about another another rabbit hole, let's say, that I haven't gone down yet that I, I have on my list? Madame Blavatsky. Well, that was that was what? the other person who's at the end of every damn uh, okay, alley for sure. It's either, it's either Swedenborg or Blavatsky. One no, of true. Yeah. Um, so again, wow. Um, only go down that rabbit hole if you're re re really willing to do a lot of work and do a lot of reading. So Blavatsky was a Russian um, a woman of, of aristocratic descent who ended up in the U.S. founding something called the Theosophical Society in 1875, which is extremely influential. It's really hard to emphasize how influential this was. And really what theosophy came to be known for in the late 1800s and the early, early 1900s was a kind of comparative religion and a kind of emphasis on what they called the latent powers in man. And of course, they were using gendered language at that time. But they, they really meant it. Um, theosophy was really the was really the mechanism through which the fascination with Egypt um, partially entered Europe and America and certainly India uh, in, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So they were very, and, and theosophy was very influential on Indian politics, by the way, and, and Indian independence and early Indian nationalism. So just had a tremendous influence. And some of the, like Annie Basad, some of the, the people who took over theosophy after Blavatsky died were very um, politically involved around gender and sex sexuality and, and uh, independence, kind of an anti-colonial independence. Blavatsky's like, theosophy is hugely influential on what we think of as the New Age movement and on the counterculture. And even on the UFO culture, there's a whole theosophical wing of, of UFO culture that's that's obviously theosophical. And so any any talk you get of hit masters, hidden masters, or occult powers, or you know, th this is all this is largely theos or auras or the astral plane, or I mean, I could go on and on. That is largely indebted to 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 theosophy, not entirely. Yeah. I'm I'm just realizing what a, a amazing opportunity I have now to ask a religious scholar all of my <laughs> crazy questions, and they're pouring out of my head. Uh, so, Padre Pio. Yeah. What do we make of this story? Can you well, tell you, you just story? jump from Emanuel Swedenborg to That's Adam it. Blavatsky to Padre Pio. Oh my God! I want to give people a background in all of the, the, <laughs> the great names that they should go check out. Um, Padre Pio. Okay, so. Italian priest, very, very Roman Catholic, uh, and probably the most famous modern stigmatic, um, to use the, the Catholic language. A stigmatic is someone who who, who has the wounds of, of Christ. Usually, by the way, wounds in the palm, it's almost certainly that Jesus was not crucified in the palms, by the way. Huh. Almost certainly <laughs> crucified in the wrists, because the palm will just rip. Uh, I see. Um, but in medieval art, the the crucifixion was always through the palm. So this, this stigmata is interesting because it's likely some kind of response to Christian art on, on some kind of unconscious level. And usually the first stigmatic is, is identified as St. Francis of Assisi. The, the guy in your garden with the birds, that was one intense dude. And... You, you know, when I went to Assisi, you could, like, see his bloody socks, Will. I mean, they were still caked with blood. So he had wounds in his feet and in his, his hands and probably on his side. And Padre Pio is, in some ways, the kind of the successor, the sort of modern successor of this. And there was a lot of miraculous events around Padre Pio. He died, what, a couple decades ago? I don't know what his, what his dates are. You can look them up, but... 
a lot of bilocation, by which we mean appearing in two places at once, a lot of cures, a lot of things. Well, a lot of charges of fraud and hoaxing as well, as there always as there always is in these cases. But Padre Pio is a big deal, a big deal in uh, modern modern Roman Catholicism. Was Jesus real as we know it? Did he exist on this plane as we know it? Or was he an amalgamation of these previous potentially uh, Christ-like figures? I think so. I'm not a New Testament critic, Will, but I... I grew up with that. I mean, I read a ton of New Testament criticism. I know some New Testament critics. I, I know that the overwhelming uh, position of New Testament critics is that, yeah, Jesus of Nazareth was a real historical person. What what he thought of himself or what he thought of his own experiences is the big question. Um, and, you know, parts parts of the what became the four Gospels, well, none of them were were can be traced back to the life of Jesus. They're all they're all quite late. Um, the earliest one is probably in the 60s or 50s, probably 60s, uh, and that's the Gospel of Mark. And so, you know, that that's the most studied case in the entire entire world. And what scholars tend to do, not all of them, but they tend to separate what they call the historical Jesus from the Christ of faith. And the historical Jesus is the human being whom we can know with historical methods and textual analysis. And the Christ of faith is the, the sort of mystical experience that later people had of this, this person, like Paul, for example, never met the historical Jesus, but had an experience of the Christ of light. And so that's, that's the distinction people generally make, but not everybody makes it. And some people think, that the historical Jesus had these experiences as well, and was very much identified with some with with the Godhead or or who we called the Father. Um, yeah. But again, Will, we don't, you know, from a scholarly point of view. I, let me let me put it this way: mm -hmm. I was once asked to respond to a New Testament critic at my university, and I think the kids, and I call them kids because they're young, they are kids. I think they thought I would come in and deny everything that this New Testament scholar was saying. Because they brought in a very um, um, traditional, uh, kind of conservative New Testament scholar who just said basically what I just said, you know. And and it, what I actually, how I actually responded was, I said, look, human beings have experience of divinity all over the world and for all, all through the centuries, the, the experiences of Jesus as being God are not unique, by the way. and But they are very, very human, and they usually get repressed. They usually get denied. In the, the case of the historical Jesus, he literally gets killed by the state, by the way. Crucifixion was the electric chair of the time. It was very public. It was very awful and nasty, and it was meant to, to, to um, send us a very strong signal. So I, my, I guess what I'm trying to say is people have experiences of deification in all kinds of cultural contexts, and only some of those get picked up, and that one of that rabbi in the first century gets turned into a major world religion, but, but that doesn't mean he's the only one. It just means that's the one we remember and that we memorialize. And I, I think the, the, the students were surprised to hear me say that. Um, but I honestly think that. I think that's just true. One of the most important things you can do if you're trying to earn more money is learn new skills. Stacking skills is one of the greatest things you can do in order to bring value to yourself and the people around you, especially one like learning a new language. I bet most of you guys had no idea that I could speak nine languages and that we have a YouTube channel with almost 100,000 subscribers where I do exclusively just that. And we break down the method for exactly what an idiot guy like me has done in order to do this. It's not complex, it's not complicated, and most of you guys have probably used the traditional method, and the traditional method sucks. That's why you can't speak any Spanish after four years of going to high school and taking Spanish week in, week out. If you want to learn to speak a language the fastest, easiest, and most natural way, click the link right down below, Golaremi Languages, we've got the method for you, check it out. Now we live in a world of which there's tons of religions, tons of different uh, portals. They all do seem to 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 lead back to one thing. I mean, regardless of whether the the Abrahamic 
uh, religions or not, it does seem to lead towards this unconditional love. Uh, you 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 live past this body. Uh, they share so many similarities. So many of the religions share uh, similarities in the, at their core, uh, and then sprinkle out into so many different things that one has to do in order to connect with God and, and reach God, which is another reason why I was always fascinated. I, I actually went to Catholic school. My parents were not overtly religious. I always, always put that in there, but I ended up going to grade school, high school, and then I went to St. Louis University for a year and a half, which is a Jesuit uh, college. And so um, I have this big education where I've always had studies within the Catholic uh, faith, et cetera. But I was always fascinated by the Gnostics, they they would get a small little blurb uh, in <laughs> you know in a Catholic books uh, you know thing like oh there are these people and they kind of feel like they could do it themselves but we don't want to talk about them <laughs> <laughs> like let's talk about what we have to say here's our priest and so I was always fascinated by by those what sort of role do you think that the Gnostics have played I mean I feel like it's something that's continuing to be you know talked about and rediscovered we talk about the like, Gospel of Thomas etc but what do you think? Well, first of all, I often describe myself as a Gnostic intellectual. Okay, so I align myself with that um, form of thinking. I wrote an entire book called The Serpent's Gift, and the subtitle is Gnostic Reflections on the Study of Religion. So I, listen, okay. I am very much aligned with that. What I'll say, I'll say a couple things. One is that there's no such thing as, as early Christianity. There, there are early Christianities there were hundreds of ways of being following this this Jesus um, figure. And the Gnostic Christians of the second and third century were very much a part of this, and they were very Christian, Will. But what they did was they, I think, let me back up. Some Most people think of God as some kind of external creator God that's outside the natural world, and that we are separate from this God. We are creatures or created beings of this God. What the Gnostics said was, no, you're not. <laughs> you're, you're actually identical with God. This, there's this spark of, of divinity in you, and it's not created. It's part of the Godhead. And so the goal of the religious life is to remember that, to remember your own divinity and get back to your own identity with the Godhead and then they reversed a lot of the, the biblical stories. So if the early Christians were saying, oh, there was this Adam and Eve and this snake and, and um, this garden, the Gnostics were saying, well, the hero of that story is clearly the snake. Yeah. <laughs> and the fool or the, the enemy of the story is clearly God. And mm -hmm. the point of the story is to become a God. I mean, that's what, that's what mm -hmm. this lower deity, as the Gnostics called him, prevents the young couple from doing, but from eating the from the second tree. So Gnosticism, what I'm trying to get at, Gnosticism, it means gnosis. Gnosis is direct knowledge of one's own divinity. Not It's not knowing about something. It's becoming something. Okay? So early Christian Gnosticism, or early the early Gnostic Christians, was just one of hundreds of forms of Christianity, and it gets suppressed. It gets, it gets blown out in the early centuries. It was, it's always had this interesting life in the 20th century, particularly in the U.S., particularly in a woman named Elaine Pagels, who is a scholar at Princeton and wrote a book in 1978, or I guess 1978, called the Gnostic Gospels. And she really beautifully describes the Christianity of these early Christians. And that was extremely powerful and attractive to lots of people. And there were other more sort of popular non-academic forms of Gnosticism that arose in the, in the 20th century. But that's, that's why we have what we have today. We have this sort of renaissance or resurgence of, of Gnosticism. It was considered a heresy or something bad for millennia. But now we're like, I'm not so sure that's bad. I'm, I mean, first of all, the word heresy, it just means choice. It just means opinion. Um, okay. That's, that's her really? heresy means it's Greek for opinion. And oh. the, the charge of the early church fathers was that these people were following their own opinion and not the position <laughs> of the 
of the church. That's well, hilarious. That's, yeah. that's what we mean by religious yeah. freedom today. I mean, it's like, oh my God, that's like wow. not so not us. Um, yeah. So you know, okay. that's a long, that's a long professorial lecture on Gnosticism, but I am. Um, I love I love it. I think it's great. I agree. I agree. Uh, I, I mean, that could be another character of uh, from the West and the individual nature of our of our of our upbringing to to some degree. But I also find it tremendous that you can set out on this, that you have the divine within you, and that it's on you, obviously, to go seek that out and to bring it forward. Yeah, and to, to you know to to say something very admiring about the Catholic tradition, which it sounds like you were trained in, the Catholic intellectual tradition is really profound. And, you know, I was introduced to Gnosticism through the Catholic intellectual tradition. So it's got in itself, it's got this sort of questioning, sort of reflexive nature. And I'm not claiming to represent that tradition because I don't. Um, but it, to the extent that it's open to these other forms of Christianity, it's really remarkable. Uh, before we get off Christianity uh, here in, in general, uh, I wanted to take it back to another one of these. You mentioned on another podcast a couple, uh, I believe it was a, I want to say one may have been a nun, uh, 16th and 17th century. Uh, they were levitating. Oh, yeah. Teresa, their... Teresa of Avila and Mary Agreda. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Could you tell a, a bit more about that? I've heard stories about levitation. I've never done anything in depth to know what was really going on. And I know we still don't know what's going on or what, but what were the reports of these people? Well, okay. So, <laughs> so first of all, um, one of my colleagues named Carlos Iyer wrote a book called They Flew. And he's a, Carlos is a historian and he literally looks at early modern Europe particularly Italy and Spain, and he shows that cases of levitation were very prominent and very common. Um, they were also very controversial, but not for the reasons I think modern people think. People were not questioning that these people floated off the ground. What they were questioning was whether this was from God or the devil. That was the, that was the question. Um, and so for Teresa... So Teresa of Avila, first of all, she's she's an abbess, which means she's in control of a she's the head uh, of a of a convent in Avila or Avila. I don't know how to pronounce it in Spanish, and um, she's floating off the ground, and it's embarrassing to her, particularly when when uh, noble women are visiting the convent. So she she does things like she prays to God to remove it for one thing. Uh, and she also asks her sisters to jump on her whenever she starts to float off the ground. Because she doesn't, I mean, Will, come on. If you're floating off the ground, you don't want to float off the ground in front of your friends. You, you, want, to, you want to be on the ground. I would love it, yeah. personally. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe not. You know, who, yeah, who yeah, yeah, let's wait till it happens. Um, so, what? And, and with jo Joseph of Cupertino was another Franciscan friar who was famous for levitating. And... Maria of Agreda was also another Spanish nun uh, later on in the, in the late 16, early 1700s, who was famous for floating or levitating. But what's interesting about all three of those cases is they weren't in control of it. Ah. Levitation was something that happened to them. It wasn't something that they willed. It wasn't, um, it wasn't a practice or, or a superpower in the way we think of that. But of course, it was a superpower that says they were freaking floating off the ground. <laughs> I mean, and Joseph, the stories of Joseph were hilarious. Like he like flies up into an olive tree and somebody has to get a ladder to get him down. I mean, he can't even get down. So, I mean, this is like, this is like real stuff. And there are hundreds and hundreds of witnesses. I'm not talking about one case or one person, right? We're talking about court documents, by the way. People swore on the fate of their souls that they witnessed up close Joseph of Cupertino float off the ground. And they did this in hundreds of cases. So, And Joseph did this in front of noble people and in front of uh, church leaders. And I mean, this was not this was not a debate. No, there's no debate about this historically. But there was a debate at the time, again, on whether, what was the source of this and um and so I think I think that's really key. I also know to go back to stigmata. You know, I I live I've, I've lived in towns that are entirely Protestant, and 
I think the Protestants hear this story, they're like, wow, that is creepy. That sounds like a oh, horror movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I get that. I totally get that. So yeah. it's that's kind of the 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 question about okay, who's piercing or what's piercing? And by the way, Francis died young. So we don't know what he died of, but he died young. And Joseph and Teresa and Maria, what's making them float off the ground? We we don't know, but the church later declares, oh, well, this was God, and but we don't know that. And and when Teresa writes her autobiography, she write, she's called The Vida, The Life, they lock it away, Will. And when Joseph of Cupertino was floating, they basically imprison him in monasteries and churches to try to keep him away from the people because they're so worried about What's gonna? What are the people gonna think? And are they gonna deify or sanctify this person? So you know, the church, the church has legitimate. I mean, I'm not questioning that. If I had a faculty member who was floating off the ground, I would probably be worried too. But, <laughs> but the point is, is that they really did this, and there's as much good historical evidence for that as there is anything else we talk about in history. But we right. we don't talk about it because it so offends our, I think, our physics. <laughs> Our our our, sci our science and because um, something's happening to the physics, these these people are floating. I'm not talking about something in your head or some dream you had. I'm like, no, this this guy is six inches off the ground, and I I don't actually know how he's doing that, or he's not doing it. Something else is. Yeah, and uh, to be closed off to the question seems strange to me. I just don't I don't understand. We clearly don't, and even in a in a perfect scientific pursuit of everything that we're doing. We don't know everything. We don't know everything, which leaves out the, the question, like, you know, what else is it that we don't we don't know? I mean, it's only going to be, and I also wanted to discuss just where you think we're going now with the new AI explosion and all of this stuff. What is this actually going to, you know, going to mean for our, let's say, abilities as we change, uh, as we be morph more into our phones and put them inside of our brains and inside of our bodies, which is already happening, obviously. But, uh, you know, where do you think that's going to take us for an understanding of all these mysteries? So I'm very, I'm very down. I was very skeptical on, on AI and, and social media in general. And I'm an old, I'm an old guy for one thing. I'm with you there. Um, I'm with you there. So, but yeah. I'm also an educator and I know, I can tell you with absolute confidence that the cell phone and the computer have destroyed the classroom. Okay. I can tell you that. more specifically. Could you be more specific? Um, young people are coming to class and they're just doing shit on their, on their phones and their, their, their computer screens. They don't care what I say or what the professor says, or they're not there. They are not there. They are, um, in social media land. <laughs> and also what's happening on a more fundamental level you know, I call it the Twitterization of consciousness. It, it's distracting people endlessly. People can't read anymore. Will I, I know, <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, Trust me, I know. Yeah, yeah. So, and and I say that as a self description too. I I find it harder to read. But the reason we can't read is because we're on social media so often, and it so scatters us. There's so much dopamine or whatever whatever reductive explanation you want to use. We are, we are being rewarded for being distracted. And what education is about is being focused. And that's hard. That's really hard. So AI, let's go to AI. So AI, sure. I don't think there's anything artificial or intelligent about AI. <laughs> I, I think it's human beings who are doing these things. And we, because we live in a scientific, scientific world, we think that the production model is correct. We think that that mind or consciousness is produced by little tiny physical forces. And so we imagine that a computer, which is also, by the way, created by tiny little physical forces, oh will someday become conscious. But but it won't. It won't yeah. because we've got our metaphysics. We've got our mind brain thing completely upside down. It's really mind that's primary and, and the brain is secondary. And 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 I, I think the exact same thing of AI. I think 
the the belief that the computer is going to be conscious and take over the world and we're going to live in some zombie apocalypse i think it's nutty i think it's like that's just nutty i mean all you do is freaking unplug the thing you know or, or you write the write the code in a different way and i know computer scientists and i know that what you get out of a computer program is is what you put in you know so there there is consciousness in the ai but it ain't the computer it's it's the people doing it and so so that's i'm skeptical of that it's and it's not that ai is not a good thing i use ai every day by the way i i commute into work and my truck tells me how fast to go and 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 allows me not to hit vehicles i mean it has remote control that's all ai um and I, so we use AI all the time. I, I think AI is a great thing, but to to put our to put responsibility on it and to put consciousness on it, I think is a huge philosophical mistake. Yeah, I I would I would echo that. And just to touch on your your point on social media, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the work of Cal Newport and the book Deep Work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and to sum it up, in its uh, most simple terms is essentially that the society is going to split between the people who can pay attention and the ones who can't. Yeah. And he was projecting out to the future. And I think this book was written in maybe 2014. Um, and I think it's, it's already happened. Uh, you know, it's quite clear that majority of people have issues um, concentrating and that it's affecting. And the reason I wanted to ask you that question is because I knew you would go on with i didn't know you would take it to the education area but i know that it's definitely affecting spirituality uh and your connection to nature and to yourself and other things because you're clearly you have an external focus one with which is not focused on anything it's just it's just all over the place and so it's very hard for you to sit down and have a long-form conversation or to, to you know to really understand your emotions and your feelings and and, and etc and so i i was I had a I had a suspicion that you might uh, say that it was an issue, let's say, um, in trying to understand and move forward with all this. Could we just really quickly, because you've mentioned we've talked about the materialist worldview, uh, what is a, a better functioning model of reality then for us and consciousness if it's not that? Well, I, I personally think the better model is that consciousness or mind is primary, and that. The material world is certainly a manifestation of, of some deeper mind or consciousness, but I think we have it exactly reversed. Uh, and I think we live, um, I mean, this has real existential or spiritual results or costs. Because we assume materialism, um, we live in a fundamentally depressing worldview. We, Will and Jeff, are nothing but dying social animals. And when we get old and 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 die, it's over. Poof, goes out like a light bulb. That is absolutely not how the rest of human civilization has experienced the human condition. That's that's a very recent, very modern, I think, kind of crazy notion. Uh, if we lived in a a worldview that that accepted consciousness or mind as more primary or 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 as fundamental, I think we would treat each other differently. Um, I also think we would treat the nature, the natural world and, and what we eat and how, how we live. Um, I actually don't think there's such a thing as nature because that word presumes that it's separate from us. I, I don't think it's separate point. from us. I think we're it. Right. We're it. Yeah. And But once you make that move, you're going to change, I think, fundamentally how you value things and how you live. And uh, you know, I'll just to just give you a simple thing. I mean, I, I always tell people, don't shit in your living room. <laughs> and well, but that's what we're doing. We're shitting in our living room. And I'm like, yeah. but that's your living room. That's where you live. Yeah. That you know, and that's you actually. That's your body. That's your body. And again, once you make that move, it's like, oh man, everything, everything changes. So I, I actually think the fundamental change that has to happen is this. What I, it's what I call the flip. It's it's you think consciousness or mind or soul or whatever your language is is primary, and the material world is is certainly important. And I think that's a much better worldview than the one we're in right now. Do, do I know it's right? No, I don't know it's right. 
But does yeah. it produce better effects and better? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's like people ask me, well, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And I say, well, I'm an optimist. And But the reason is because there are, there are actually far more reasons to be a pessimist about the future. But thought tends to produce itself. Yeah. If you think the future sucks, then guess what? The future is likely going to suck. If you're an optimist, the chances are pretty high that you're going to that thought is going to produce itself and that the future is going to be somehow better. And I don't mean that individually, Will. I don't mean whatever Jeff thinks or Will thinks. I mean, as a culture, you know, like why, why is it when you turn Netflix or Apple or whatever your streaming service on, why are all the shows dystopians? Yeah. When's the last time you saw a utopian future? That's so true. I can't name a single series. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to talk about. And I know the history of human civilization and certainly the history of religions is more utopian than dystopian, by the way. Okay, in what sense? Meaning that there, we, we always feel that there's going to be a, in the end, God wins. Yeah, the end is always good. I mean, it, the good uh -huh. wins out in the end or the, mm -hmm. the soul is saved or whatever, the, whatever the, the telos or the end or the meaning of the worldview is. But, you know, good things win in the end. And again, I don't know that. Uh, that's, that that's maybe too simplistic a way to put it. But we have a lot of challenges and problems, obviously. But it does matter. It matters a great deal whether you think we can do this or not. Could you touch on, because you just d discussed the, uh, how important, obviously, uh, your thinking. The whole new, let's go from the new thought movement as well as the new age movement, as well as what we have now in a manifestation and all these things. Given what you've studied and how this has changed in a lot of the the traditions, where do you put this, the movement and understanding of manifestation? I'm talking about specifically within your own life and world and your effect, because you've just said essentially in a practical terms, it's probably better to think positive about the future yeah. than to think negative. And then, so you're basically giving some power <laughs> to your thoughts. Where and what have you studied that confirms that or denies that or pushes for that? Yeah. So just quickly, New Thought is a movement in the 19th century and the early 20th century that saw the mind as capable of, of informing physical reality. You know, you you basically could could think your own your own future or your own your own worldview. What we think of this as the new age is really comes about in the 1980s, and it's really a, a conglomeration of of movements and and thinkers in the 50s, 60s, and 70s who were focusing in on how things were changing dramatically. The the age of Aquarius, as the young people put it in the 1960s, was was upon us, and we were no longer in this monotheistic mode. We were moving into a kind of more magical or, or animistic or nature-centered mode. Now, speaking personally, I'm happy to speak personally. Um, in 1998, I was invited to something called the Eslin Institute in Big Sur, California, and which is was one of the the nodes of the American counterculture. It was, it, you know, Eslin and Monterey and, and Haight-Ashbury were three nodes of this, this counterculture movement of this young people. And and so I end up writing a really big book called Eslin, America and the Religion of No Religion. It came out in 2007. And it's really not just about Eslin. It's about Eslin as a kind of cipher for the entire counterculture, the, the psychedelics and the Asian religions and, and the anti-war <clears throat> civil rights and women's movements. And I mean, everything, not everything, but most things we think of, um, originated in, in the 60s and 70s in, in some fashion. That, that movement also birthed something called the Human Potential Movement, which essentially is it's based on Aldous Huxley. Um, mm -hmm. And it basically argues that there are yeah. potentials, potentialities or abilities in the human being that are not normally accessed, but that they can be accessed through things like mescaline, by the way, psychedelics, but also mm -hmm. practice. And that these things are worth actualizing because they they result in a much grander and more cosmic view of the human being. 
I I happen to agree with that. I happen to agree with Aldous Huxley, and I certainly inhabit that. I still I sit on the board at Esalen. I try to guide <clears throat> that movement. Um, I do think that the mind has extraordinary abilities that we generally make fun of, um, but that are nevertheless true. I, I think the mind does have a capacity to inform historical or physical reality. But but I don't mean that always individually either, Will. I mean that culturally. I think communities and societies have an ability to change history. Sometimes individuals do, sometimes they don't, depending on um, on what happens. I tend to see the same, uh, and one that's not brought up on belief. Uh, I mean, I've talked not too much at length uh, on the podcast, just on my own upbringing and and uh, desires to get into spirituality, lucid dreaming, uh, meditation. You know, my fight and struggle to think whether or not this is is this bullshit. Like, what am I? Because it's ridiculous. Like if you don't grow up doing it or anything, sitting down and then deciding that you have to focus your mind or relax your body, that you're going to get some benefit from it. If you look at contemplative disciplines throughout history, what they're basically about is shutting down the brain. It's basically about doing nothing. You know, so when you meditate, if you look at the the, the early manuals on on yoga it's a it's precisely about shutting down brain processes it's not about activating brain processes and the assumption i think underlying not just yoga and meditation but also many forms of contemplative prayer is that the body and the brain are a kind of filter or a transmitter of of, of god or, or some greater mind but you're not normally aware of that because you're just you're thinking too much and so the goal of this is to shut down and to calm and to silence thought. And this, by the way, is why AI and social media are so devastating to the spiritual life, because they it's just chatter. It's just constant chatter. Um, and people need to be quiet and to, to stop talking and stop thinking. Um, so that's profound, but that depends on your how you think about the relationship between the mind and the brain. And I think, and also the other thing I'll say about, you mentioned belief. I don't have a religion, uh, but I'm a very religious person, but I don't believe because what I think belief is, it's sort of looking to the past and you're trying to approximate the religious experiences of your, your ancestors or people way, way in the back somewhere. And I don't think that's possible. And I think the human potential movement, you turn around and you say, no, um, we can learn a lot from the past. We need the past. Let's let's study the past. But actually, there's a fuller, greater truth in the future. And we don't know what that is, but let's work toward it. So it's it's a, literally a turning around from the past to the future. But it's not that you believe in the future. It's that you're trying to edge your way into the future. You're trying to do something that, that can affect it, essentially. And the other reason I don't like beliefs is they are all contradictory. People believe <laughs> completely contradictory things. And I'm like, come on, just stop it. Just stop it. Let's yeah. go on. Let's go on. Yeah. And one of those things that we all live with these contradictions in our beliefs, and this can be small and and big, uh, and we never examine them. We don't examine. We kind of just muddy. The, 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 the waters are completely muddy, and we just kind of move on with it. We'll be faced with our contradictions or our beliefs about people, things, uh, opinions, and et, et cetera. We just kind of move on from it. But uh, this is how, yeah, this is how I was, you know, when I was trained in the study of religion, this is how we thought of myth, by the way. Myth, myth does uh, not mean <clears throat> falsehood or untruth. It's essentially the water the fish are swimming in, and they don't know it's water. It's the worldview you have not stepped out of and reflected on. And my, you know, my joke here is always it's actually Star Trek. It's like you, the 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 myth for most people is Star Trek. It's that we can solve any cosmic problem in about thirty eight minutes with commercial. And <laughs> of yeah. course, you can't. That's not true. That that's just a myth. That's it's a good story, right. makes a good television series, but it's not true. And I think people still live in that myth, Will. 
they still think, oh, well, we'll just do enough science and technology and we'll figure this climate crisis out or we'll figure this. No, you won't. You, you, you need a different set of values. It's not about more and more science and technology. It's, it's about a better worldview. And uh, I, I find it crazy also, too. I know we have done great things with science and technology, and we will continue to do so, of course. But in a pure problem-solving, uh, when I look to try and solve problems, you, can, you do have these kind of two options, it does seem. And I had this conversation, I can't remember when, uh, now, you have your intellect to pull on. You have this other option, these kind of things that we talked about. What if you if you could, let's say, say your intuition, uh, dreams, uh, which have gotten a, a whatever rap in, in as far as our society. We just don't care. Like they're fake. They're this. A lot of times they have no meaning. And when you can combine them both using the intellect, logic, and all these the amazing things that it that they are along with that other side you get a general you get a better general picture and they're all tools you know to say you're a completely hairy fairy i'm off on the mountain and everything i see is real and you know there's entities here and there and then the the same the materials are, are both they need to be combined uh and they are one and the same thing at least it, it appears to be uh from what i can see well what the way this is usually talked about you know you you know you have two brains you have you have a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere and they're actually completely separate and they're connected of course and they talk to each other but they perceive the world uh and themselves in very different ways and there are people who have talked about this in a very elegant way ian mcgillchrist is usually the the figure that's invoked at this point or jill bolte taylor who uh, wrote a book called My Stroke of Insight, which I strongly recommend if you haven't read it. I've, I've seen it. No, um, yeah. I mean, basically what happens to Taylor is she's a neuroanatomist. So she's an expert on how the brain is, is physiologically arranged. And she has a stroke. Um, and it, it completely shuts down the left side of her brain. And she basically enters these mystical states because now she just has... <laughs> her right hemisphere. And she realizes that, oh, what we think of as the self or the thinking self or the mathematical, it's just, it's it's one side of us. It's not the whole person. And so her stroke of insight is that insight, that, that the person is complex. And it's actually dreams and images and stories. They all come primarily from the right side, from the right hemisphere. And that's what we have dismissed today. So for like, again, to go back to my own professional world, you can't, you don't, you can't fund the arts um, or, <laughs> or uh, study religion or literature, or history. The, the money is all in, in STEM. It's all, it's all on the left side of the brain, by the way. Right. Um, right. And it's not that the left side is not important. Of course, that's important, but you have dismissed all of these capacities of the human that, that are on the other side of the brain. And that's taken centuries, by the way, Will. That's not something, I, I'm not blaming anybody for, there's no conspiracy theory there. It's just, that's what human culture and Western society in particular become over the last four or 500 years. Yeah, it's it, it's fascinating to see. But it, what I find also so interesting is that it really wasn't that long ago when you talked about the new thought um, movement as well that extends right uh, into this potentially the end of the 19th century as well. It was right, is this, it's, it's there. And there was a belief in many parts of that movement in, you could go to an event on Friday night, might be the Ouija board, might be the spiritual, like the, you could move things, the tables would move and all this stuff. And that is so recent, you know, to think that, I don't know when that sort of kind of died out and we completely put it in the, the 20th back century said, killed it. <laughs> Okay. All right. Yeah. Because to think that that was just long ago that a Friday night entertainment would be go try and call some people who died, you know? Well, remember again, let's go back to my social media kick. Uh, there's no TV. <laughs> there's yeah. no radio. We're bored. There's yeah. nothing yeah. In, in 1888. Yeah. I mean, you, you just got people getting together at yeah. eight in the evening and they, they can't yeah. watch their devices or their screens. So, they're going to yeah. do really interesting stuff. 
I, that, yeah, it, I find it so fascinating. The other thing I'll say, Will, and you'll find this interesting. So I wrote this book in 2010 called Authors of the Impossible. And what it sh what I one of the things I took away from that project was all of these words we have today, like paranormal or psychical or supernormal, they're, they're all invented by intellectuals and scientists at the end of the 19th century. All of them. These are not, this is not the stuff of tabloids. This is the stuff of Nobel laureates and classicists and people at Oxford and, you know, then Harvard and Duke. And I, it just goes on and on like that. And then what happens in the 20th century is, um, is computers <laughs> and, and um, you know, a kind of understanding of the mind is just a function of the brain and the brain just is a wet computer. And that's so recent and, and, um, it just, it devastated this earlier kind of openness to this among intellectuals. I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not talking about, and the seances and the Ouija boards, the Ouija board, of course, becomes a game that we, we, uh, we buy in toy stores, but you know, it was, a, it, it means yes, yes, by the way, we, okay. we and yeah. Um, ah, okay. But it, it was an occult um, practice. It, it was about automatic writing and connecting to the spirits, who, by the way, may not be who they say they are either. I mean, there's, there's, a, real, there's a lot of complexity there. Yeah, there's a ton. There's a ton. But just the idea that, you know, you could do it, you could take it seriously. And like you said, there are Nobel laureates and people tremendous. There's this rumor, I don't know that it's true, that Albert Einstein had ISIS unveiled on his desk. We don't know. I mean, everybody likes to talk about Albert Einstein, right? He did this, he did that. But he probably was influenced by Flatland, which was another kind of spiritualist track in the in the 19th century. And he, you know, Einstein was interesting because it, his, his physics really doesn't, isn't in, intuitive. It's not something we can arrive at. At least I can't arrive at it. But if you if you talk to physicists who or cosmologists, they have crazy ideas, Will, <laughs> and and a lot of them go back to Einstein, who was who was very much um, a determinist, who thought of the world in very deterministic fashion, but also had a very profound sense of beauty and harmony and 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 deity that uh, he traced back to Spinoza, by the way. But I don't know about the ISIS, and I I can't see Albert Einstein and Madame Blavatsky in the <laughs> same room. I don't think they would have got along. Wow! But I can yeah. definitely see. Einstein reading Flatland. If you haven't read Flatland, I, I, I okay. strongly no, I recommend it. I'll check it out. Uh, j uh, just as a almost final, I guess, final question in a sense. I like to, one of the main focuses within this podcast is to always find a way to apply a lot of the knowledge that you've gained over these years and, and the experts we have on into your own life. And so my question becomes, of all these things that you have studied uh, there's a few here that you could incorporate into making your life better and making your future better, especially as I know you teach and you have young people looking for guidance. What from what you have studied and learned do you incorporate into your life or what would you suggest uh, are the most important factors that people should take yeah. on? Yeah, so I get asked that question a lot and my answer okay. is always the same. It's listen to your loved ones. And, and when, so when they... When your small child starts talking about having another life or, or another mom or a dad, don't shut the child down. Uh, or when your brother talks about the car accident he was in and how he saw a light and and God is unconditional love, don't don't shut your brother down. Don't don't roll your eyes. Um, don't say stupid things like tinfoil hat and little green men. Um, all of those things are ways that our society shuts people down. And, and so my, my strongest advice and my most practical advice is just listen to one another and allow people to ex tell the stories that happened to them. And then they'll, those stories will get integrated somehow. I don't know how they'll get integrated into the culture, <laughs> but they, I think they will. Um, so that, that would be, that would be my advice. Right. Oh, and let me say one more thing. Don't assume that the stories that your child tells or your brother or sister or your don't assume that they'll fit into your worldview. Don't. don't. 
<laughs> I, um, you know, so that that's the stack. I guess that's the the kind of the small caveat at yeah. the end. And uh, this is along the same lines here as well, uh, because I'm a I'm a huge reader, and you've you've already mentioned a bunch of books that you just gave some. Uh, but do you have potentially three books that have shaped you or that you feel would shape someone in the same manner, trying to get them to move towards a better future? I mean, I have mentioned a couple of books. Ian McGilchrist writes huge books. I'm not sure that people are up to that given social media, but they might be able, they might be up to Jill Bolte Taylor's The Stroke, My Stroke of Insight, I think, which would really help. I am, um, I mean, I'm a huge fan of, of geeky, <laughs> intellectual so tell me this is everybody's going to be dying to know if they're still here well, they're, yeah they're i'm a big fan of william blake who was a weird weird romantic british poet um particularly the marriage of heaven and hell which i think is is amazing i'm also a big fan of sigmund freud and the idea of the unconscious i'm not sure what to read the problem with freud is he wrote so much um but he does give you a profound sense that we're not in control of ourselves and that the human is something is is something other, um, and of course, in ter- I always write. I mean, I think of my books, of course, too. Um, I wrote a little bitty book, little bitty book called The Flip, which uh, and it's on audio, and it's very much about scientists and engineers and medical professionals who have some life changing flip in their life, and they totally change their view of what mind or consciousness is. And I think that's a really good place for people to go. Because, you know, I teach at Rice. Rice is a very STEMI institution. And I realized very early on that if I use people like Teresa of Avila or Joseph of Cooper, they were just going to say, oh, those are crazy religious people. They didn't know their science. So I was like, okay, here's some Nobel laureates. Right. Let's talk about these people. <laughs> and it's yeah, the yeah. same stuff, by the way, the same <laughs> crazy stuff. But now it's scientists yeah. and, and engineers and medical professionals. And the young people, they, you know, I can see their eyebrows going up. I can see, oh, so my my people, <laughs> you know, my professional scientists, they have the same sorts of experiences and have the same ideas. And that's really, I think, really significant. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I've got a lot, I've got a lot of reading here. I'm gonna end up going back through all this, continuing on on your books as well. But uh listen. Really, really, really appreciate it. It's uh, it's been good. I have a million more questions. We'll have to do it some other time. Let me also, if if I may, just put a pitch in here. And if it's not, you can just cut it out. But I'm going to be in Tuscany in uh, the end of June, early July, and the long weekend is on a book I wrote called How to Think Impossibly. And okay. if anyone wants to spend three days with me <laughs> talking about how to think impossibly this is a great this is tuscany by the way so this is a great way to do it and uh, it's called the pari center p-a-r-i okay what's their focus well their focus is on science and spirituality it's on everything we've been talking about well awesome listen thanks again we really appreciate right. it uh and uh, guys we'll link to everything obviously down below plenty of stuff and more research for you guys to do so see you later